from these findings were that um, hypertrophy can be roughly equally gained from either high uh, or moderate uh, training, like your hypertrophy range, or from a powerlifting type routine. Um, and that supports a dose response relationship for hypertrophy because it shows on a volume equated basis. It might not be when the volume is lower, but on a volume equated basis, you get roughly the same results. Um, some of the issues with the, that approach though, and this is why, so when I say from a practical standpoint, we have to look at the results and we, we have to really look with inside a research study. So you say, well, heck, I'll just train as a powerlifter then, I can get huge. Might not be that simple because the grind, and we really pushed these guys, these were trained subjects, we really pushed them. Um, two of the subjects dropped out because of injury. Virtually every one of those, I do exit interviews, I ask them how they feel, try to get a sense of how they enjoyed the program or didn't enjoy it and what their, what their feelings were. Two of them dropped out, every other one pretty much to a man complained of soreness in their joints and they wanted a break. <coughs> I need not only a deal, but I need active recovery. I want to take a week off. And they were pretty toasted after uh, this type of routine. That and those were the powerlifting group. The bodybuilding group, they had a much easier time with it. No one got injured, and they all felt they could have been pushed a lot more. Uh, I had to really reduce, because I wanted to keep the training sessions to an hour. I couldn't, um, the powerlifting were doing many more sets. They were doing more than double the number of sets, and I had a lot of rest. Their routines were taking like an hour and 15 minutes. So we never get clarity just by looking at a study. Each one builds, research should be foundational, it should be building to start to see, and then you need to take the current body of literature into account when you are trying to make decisions on how to use it. All right, so uh, current guidelines generally show that 65% 1RM is your minimal threshold, when you start going below that, you're not going to be able to get hypertrophy. You guys familiar with that research? See, seen it? Now, by the way, a lot of this is not research-based. It was more just intuitive-based, as we're going to get into. Um, I will tell you that as a researcher, I make hypotheses. You have, as a researcher, you have to make a research hypothesis. So when you start a study, you say, I'm going to carry out this study, and I believe that the results are going to show this. That's your research hypothesis. Uh, one thing I can tell you is I am wrong, uh, and I'm proud to be wrong. Because as a scientist, it's not about being right; it's about getting it right. It's about understanding. So uh, there are a lot of people in the research field that once they start getting their research philosophy, they want to cling to it because now oh, I've, I've made my decision, I've, I've, I've taken my stance, I've stepped into the water, and I don't want to step back out now because I'll look dumb. Uh, but what we do know is that you need to recruit it, and then you need to keep it stimulated for a given period of time. Uh, maximal muscle growth is predicated on recruiting as many motor units as possible, and achieving high fire rates, firing rates for a sufficient period of time for <coughs> those fires. We do that, we can stimulate the protein synthetic response to a optimal point where it's going to optimize hypertrophy. For type two fibers, are the hypertrophy fibers. And that really the type 1 fibers don't contribute as much to hypertrophy as they Really, they don't have hypertrophic potential. And yeah, it's been shown that fast switch fibers are more hypertrophic, that they have about 50% greater hypertrophy experience, 50% greater hypertrophy than the type 1s when subjected to a resistance training program. But this is where you gotta look into the research. If you just take that research at face value, you said, hey, I wanna concentrate on these type 1s because the type 2s uh, type twos, because the type ones are really not doing much. Well, take a look, let's think about how do these studies, when they're gonna study this type of um, uh, phenomenon, what do the studies do? They're gonna take a moderate to uh, he moderate load to heavy load training session, because that's a customary training, right? They're gonna do 75% one RM, 80% one RM. Well, it might just be that the type of training, you have to look at the training approach. Perhaps the training approach is what is focusing on these type two fibers. What if you did a 50% one RM? Which conceivably, as we'll talk about, might have a greater effect on type one hypertrophy. Along with my good colleague, James Krieger, we actually carried out a meta-analysis where we looked at all the studies that did 65% uh, and above versus 60% and below. So they had to compare 60% one RM and below versus 65% and above. Uh, we had 191 subjects, eight studies met the inclusion criteria. 
And while we found that both studies did show significant growth, it did seem to be uh, favoring, the probability seemed to be towards heavier loading producing greater growth. Substantial hypertrophy can be achieved with either heavy loads or flat loads, but there is emerging research that there might be a fiber type specific response. Most of the research, the vast majority is carried out on average people, and even the, like when I have resistance trained subjects, they're not high level bodybuilders or powerlifters. It's just virtually impossible to get them into study. When we don't have this evidence, then we start reverting to this evidence. And then you go down the chain. So we always can have logical reason. But without the scientific method available, so if there's an area of, of study that we don't have reasoning on, or we don't have evidence on, we go to logical reason. Well, I'd, virtually any applied question is going to be relevant to the context that you give me. There's no one answer. There's no one cookie cutter answer that will fit every any question that we give you on, on an applied topic like exercise and nutrition. Other than of saying, hey, this isn't working for you, we might need greater volume, we might need less volume, might need to push you harder, might need to have more rest because you're overtraining. And there's all sorts of things you, you can do to ultimately get that person gains. Will this person ever see the gains of this person? Probably not, no. Properly structured, periodized routine uh, maintains performance, and ultimately you look, as we'll talk about, to super compensate. You're gonna try to build so that you're driving your body up, 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 and it's gonna really hit a point where, hey, I'm gonna push it now, beyond where it's going, then you're gonna have this phase where you, you're gonna uh, back off a little, let the body heal, and then you're gonna come down and then build it back up again and keep it going in this wave-like fashion. Some people will tell you that undulating is better and that the literature shows that. Uh, it's still very, the literature's all over the place with that. And again, not from the, the hypertrophy literature really doesn't give you any clue. There's been very few studies. It's more in the strength literature. I would say if I had to um, give a, an opinion as to which one in the literature comes out on top, it might be BUP, but here's the kicker there. There's, as I mentioned before, a gazillion different ways you can do a linear, and, and really a lot of ways you can do undulating, daily undulating as well, certainly linear. There's so many different ways you can structure linear programs. So you can only say they're comparing this daily undulating to this linear. Doesn't mean that different variations of them wouldn't have a different effect. So from Brad, who presented in after James, again, great, great presentation, really enjoyed it. Maximal muscle mass, who doesn't want to talk about that? Uh, it's something I'm very personally interested in and intrigued by, and I've used much of his uh, kind of practices to build my own physique and develop my clients' physiques. So something I really took away from Brad was the fact you can grow muscle using a very varied approach, and actually varying your approach is a very good thing to do, um, as long as it's kind of systematic planned variation. And there is no hypertrophic rep range, you should and can use high reps, low reps, and there's kind of th that range um, to build. Uh, something I did take away was that the lowest you kind of, that they found you want to go, is probably 40% of your one rep max. Anything lighter than that is kind of not enough stimulation for muscle growth. It's kind of like the fact that it volume is king, but it has to be stimulative volume. So you think someone like a marathon runner does a lot of volume on their legs, they're using their muscles a lot, but they're not growing to a huge degree. So you need to find that sweet spot between stimulation and high volume and where they cross over is kind of where you wanna go. And you might call this something like maximal recoverable volume, um, you might call it maximal stimulative volume, um, and it tends to have you working between it depends on the individual, eight to 12 reps, but you can use lower reps like threes and you can use reps up to 30. You wanna kind of program that so you're getting, the, you're hitting the three mechanisms of hypertrophy. So you're getting tension, you're getting metabolic stress and you're getting damage. The way you program for that is very highly individual. Um, as long as you, you wanna keep specific, so if your goal is muscle growth, you want to make sure you're specifically training for muscle growth and not strength, for example. And that's where people can get a bit misled with powerlifting too much and focusing just on strength. And they may be getting stronger. That's not always that you're getting bigger. Um, 
individuality is huge. So some people do really well with high reps, other people do better with low reps. And it's not to say you shouldn't do both, but you might find you grow better focusing on one more than the other. And you might find that a certain routine, a certain frequency works better for you. And then the fact that you should use a form of periodization. I don't know of any studies that have shown where a periodized approach hasn't shown to provide better results. It's always given better results. So you want to plan in a certain way. And that actual periodization approach doesn't matter too much. There aren't any studies that clearly show um, block periodization to be far better than daily undulating periodization or vice versa or weekly undulating periodization. You can use something that you enjoy and you find satisfies your needs. Um, I have used a daily undulating approach and I have kind of progressed towards using a daily undulating approach within a block system. I find that to be very beneficial for me and that's something I'm developing um, personally for myself and for my clients and in future.